This is Leadership in Action, and I'm Casey Cheshire. Join me as we delve deep into the passions, expertise, and experiences of Boston area innovators. Sponsored by the Boston chapter of the Entrepreneurs Organization, this is Leadership in Action. There it is. We're live. We are cranking. The lightning bolts have come down from the sky, and we are about to have one of the best podcast episodes we've ever had. I'm so glad you're all here. I can't wait to introduce you to the guest today. She is a leader, an entrepreneur, a speaker, an actress, an innovator, and an author, and probably seven other things. Uh, professional presence. Six, of, just six more things. Uh, oh, sorry. Six other things. <laughs> and obviously a lot of fun to talk to. A professional presence developer, author of Presentation Skills for Managers, which is on its second edition, people. Classmate of Jada Pinkett Smith and Tupac, founder of CEO of Ovation, Carrie Garbus. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, I, I know this is like the, the beginning. I mean, just the tip of the iceberg. We're like, okay, we're about to have this amazing, crazy show. So let me just pass it right back to you. Smash for us some kind of misconception, bogus strategy about, around leadership, being an entrepreneur, being a, a business leader. All right, here it is. If you're nervous, apprehensive, stage fright, whatever you want to call it, about anything, it is complete and utter craptastic advice to picture people naked to make you less nervous or in your underwear. There it is. Smashing it. I've smashed it. Shots fired. So, so don't do that is what you're saying. Yes. That's what I'm saying. Well, that is not what I'm saying. Do it. If it works for you, I've never met an actual human that it works for and all the, the history. And I was so, so intrigued by where this came from because this was something i don't know about you but i'd heard since i was a kid right yeah and it's like a theme it was a total thing it is it is still a total thing because i talk a lot about uh, speaker preparation speaker development and of course nerves are a huge part of that so a lot of places where i go people are like oh yeah just picture people naked and i'm like why is this it's people it's 2021 why is it still like a thing and it was re so I actually did a little research around it because I was like, okay, wait, where does it come from? And wh why is this still a thing? Very similar to my deep dive into the whole uh, jump the shark research. Oh. And um, has a very similar theme actually as to where this perpetuated, okay. oddly enough. Okay. Yeah. So it is totally rumored. There is no scientific basis. So there's no brain science behind this. And there's, because the brain science behind it would be, this is as helpful as me saying, picture people in their underwear to make you less nervous is about as helpful as me being saying, don't picture a pink elephant, go. Right. Okay, now everybody has now sees, sees a nice, rosy, healthy elephant. It's right so, there in the office. It's like literally right here. Right. Yeah. Mine's right behind your head. It's really scary. Oh. And also, so there's no brain science, right? There's no science to back this up. Right. It is rumored that it's something Winston Churchill did. And he sort of made like a hair of a reference to it in a speech once. Again, no actual documentation. No. And there it is. Yes. There's the elephant. Thank you very much. I don't know what you're talking about. I <laughs> What if it was like, that was like my eye floater, like instead of like an actual <laughs> eye floater, I just saw elephants. So we're on <laughs> and I, and I did that, that uh, emoji thing where you can pop emojis in there, but I found the elephant emoji. So literally for a second, Carrie was seeing an actual elephant. Yeah, that yeah, was, it was fantastic. So Winston Churchill, no, who, who knows, right? And like Jump the Shark, which was perpetuated by, you know, what sitcom? No, but I need to, I need to know though. Okay. Happy days. Oh. Right. Well, okay. I think, which I believe was a Sam Sherman show as well. Don't quote me on that. Somebody can correct me if that's incorrect. So the whole jump, the shark, Kate, that, that I'm getting off topic came from happy days when Fonzie actually jumped the shark. And now it alludes to something going really off track, especially in a television series. No, it's okay. Um, we're basically, we're dangling out the, the Winston Churchill thing, but we're we're going to the jump shark real quick. So did he actually jump over a shark? Wait, Fonzie? Yeah. Yes. Yes. It, he was, it was some sort of like 
he was not swimming. He was, he was, uh, <laughs> water skiing oh. and it was some sort of like very high stakes competition or something to prove that he was ultra cool. And he had to jump over a shark. Wow. So having nothing to do with Winston Churchill, this rumor, this theory of picturing people naked or in their underwear, in underwear was also perpetuated by a Brady Bunch episode. No the way. Show. That, that was my whole time. I see, I was, I was going to get there. It's 45 minutes later, but I'm there. So in an episode of the Brady Bunch, Greg and Marsha go to get their driver's license because, well, they are, they are siblings. Remember, they're half siblings. So they came from. Marcia oh, right. came for, yeah. right, you know, so that pretty much. It's the story, right? That whole. Yes, of a lovely lady. So they go to get, take their driver's test. And in that, they're both really nervous. And they both picture the driving instructor in his underwear, which was expressed on that television show, late 60s, early 70s, as he was like in, I think it was either whitey tighties or boxers and like a one of those white tank tops that some people refer to as a wife beater. Oh, geez. I think that, I think I may not. Feel well, he's just, yeah, he's in a t-shirt and uh, I'm tank Googling top. it now. He oh, let's see. Oh, let's yeah. see. So they, it's, it's still rated G, but I get it. Oh, it's totally rated G. Yes. And it had that like weird music that was like, wah, 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 you know, when, and to, it's sort of like. Wait, they did the porn star it. music when, when he. No, no. Porn star music is more like, where to go, where, where, oh, 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 right. No, this was like, waka, 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 waka. And it, it's the screen sort of like got wavy and it went into their dreamland, not fantasy Dream. of picturing this guy in his underwear. I'm saying it's not helpful. But if it works for you, go for it. So, so where does it, this come from? This comes from not, I mean, we just explain where it comes from, but like, why do we need these things? It's just, we're trying to figure out ways to distract us from the fact that we're kind of nervous to stand in front of people sometimes. Yes. So the con, the concept of it is correct. Like one of the fixes is get out of your head. So that it, it is not the most productive thing that you could do. There's much stronger other things to get out of your head, to get either like you have a voice, you know, some little guy or gal on your shoulder being like, you suck, you suck, or you're going to tank, or yes, you should yeah. be nervous. And, um, or however that manifests for you, that yes, get out of your own head, focus on a goal, focus on the audience, make it about something else other than you. So the idea is correct. The execution is um, a little funky, in my opinion. Yeah, nice. It's like, nice try. So if that's what not to do, and you started, you just started teaching us about this, what should we be doing? If we've got something we're going into presentation-wise, because I know you're coaching people all the time on this. You got a presentation, you got a little butterflies going on or the day before. What, what do you recommend? What are your best tips? Yes. So day before, day of, in the moment, halfway through, whatever it is, get out of your head. So what, so because what's happening is your, here's where some brain science comes in. Your amygdala, which is like this little almond thing in the middle of your brain, which control takes care of the emotions. It is flipping out and probably freaking out so much that it's not working. This all goes back to that flight or fight response from when we were cavemen and women and and there was a threat of like yeah. something was going to eat us at any time so even though that's not happening the people in the audience or your perceived threat isn't a lion about to pounce it feels the same way and your body thinks the same thing is going on so we have to get more to a rational side or part of our brain versus less emotional and so how you can do that is get out of your head, think of something rational. Now that could be identif fix fixating on your, focusing on your goal. Okay, I've got to excite these people. I've got to persuade them. I've got to scare them, whatever it is. Other than make them laugh because that'll just make you nervous again. I got to make yes. these people laugh. Oh God, how am I going to do that? Then right. laughing. I got to keep making them laugh. I know this is why I never went into stand-up comedy because I think right. it's terrifying. And 
the, the so focusing on the goal, it's not getting it off you, getting it on the audience. And there's a lot of different techniques. You can visualize mantra. You can go to, uh, yeah, can we, yeah. Let's go through a couple because I'm sure there's a lot of people that are like, you know what? I, a lot of entrepreneurs listening. They're like, I'm supposed to be this all mighty speaker, but man, do I still get nervous? Yeah, focus on something that isn't just I'm nervous. I'm nervous. I'm ha I'm feeling I'm because it's gonna get like all yeah. wrapped up in your head and your brain and your breathing. So the thinking about a solid, rational, fact-based goal is really, really strong, as well as it could be something physical too. You could say, I'm going to think about being in a great neutral position that we call an ovation, right? A neutral position that doesn't really mean anything when I'm in between my thoughts, or I'm going to do two-step movements, or I'm going to think about having my gestures up above my waist, uh, any sort of physical targeted thing you can think of. And then that will help you get out of your head. What is this then, neutral position you speak of? Oh, well. Yes. Remember when I said, Casey, I'm going to sit for this. Now I'm going to stand. Okay. So if you cannot see it be, it's totally cool. It's squeaking. It's not my body. Trust me. So the neutral position is easy. Uh, so equal weight on both of your feet if you're standing. Now, okay. if you can't stand or if you're sitting it's a, it, it, in a situation you can still maintain the same thing if you're not able to stand or you choose to sit or not stand in the situation. So equal weight, meaning you're not excessively leaning to one side and arms are loosely down at our side. Now this is, and I talk about this a lot and my coaches talk about this a lot, at that here's neutral position and people are like, you look like a robot and it's uncomfortable and it feels like jail. Okay, so... Sure, it's uncomfortable because we're not often used to going into an in-between position that doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point. This doesn't mean anything to your audience. And this is a position you move through. You don't live here. If I was like, hey, Casey, let's yeah. talk about the Brady Bunch and then get sidetracked with happy day. Like, and, and while I'm speaking, if you can't see me, I'm like standing like a robot, not moving. That's really weird. Right but kind of getting rid of some of your physical habits and concentrating on maintaining a neutral position in between thoughts, movements, whatever, gestures, whatever it is, can be really helpful for your audience, giving them a place to, to rest, to consume information, as well as really giving you a, a, the most confident presence possible when you're speaking. Absolutely. I like that. And for those listening, we do always video, do video, and that's on YouTube if you're curious. Like and subscribe, smash the button. That's right. <laughs> but, smash it. So so I like that the neutral position is a is a way for you to get back to just sort of baseline where you're concentrating on something other than the presentation and the audience is like, okay, even thinking about your feet, like if you, if people have ever tried to consciously put equal weight on each foot, there's it's not easy. So you're kind of like mentally thinking about that. It takes your mind away from, oh God, oh God, they're going to laugh at me. Yes. Yeah. It's a grounding technique and grounding. Cool. I have a, I have a tech, a, a trick if you'd like it. Yes. Okay. Here it is. If the swaying back and forth or not, or not being equal footed weight wise is a challenge, or even if you want a grounding technique that no one's going to know and no one's going to see. Because we've got all sorts of like rehearsal techniques, stuff I would not recommend you doing actual in, fr in front of other humans that you're not practicing in front of. Right. You could put a coin in just one of your shoes. Don't do it in both. One. And so that way, when you're standing, you're making sure, okay, one foot, I, okay, I'm feeling flat on my feet on the coin and I'm flat on the other. Again, this is getting out of your head because it takes a little more concentration oh to be present with like coin, floor, coin, floor, or shoe, foot, whatever. What size coin? I'm pretty sure everyone was thinking that. So you're all welcome. Yes. And I typically recommend uh, American quarter if okay. you have one. Good old quarter in the shoe. Quarter. Yes. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Where that came from. Okay. Quarter in the shoe. I could see how though, it just 
gets your mind. You're like, whoop, it makes you present in your body yeah. in a moment. Yeah. yeah. And that's what, like, if you're getting nervous, we get, you can get out of it. You can get distracted. You can get off track and having something really simple that no one sees to bring you back in the moment. Yeah. Very, very helpful. Because an, another thing we recommend, of course, is breathing, right? People are freaking out. They're like, breathe, breathe, just breathe. <laughs> and just yeah. breathe, Carrie, quick. <laughs> yeah. Like, never. That is helpful. And there's lots of great techniques for diaphragmatic breathing and breathing at specific breathing exercises. In the moment when we're really, really nervous or a lot of people are watching us or we think we're going to get pounced by a lion, it is very difficult to find that quiet moment to be mm -hmm. like. It, and also it looks really weird if you're in front of people. And so there's the something like grounding yourself with the coin. Uh, and of course, yes, we highly recommend breathing. We just can't always do it really, really well to the fullest extent in the moment. Yeah. Can't do it in the moment, but maybe before the moment. It's a great reminder to do that. Yes. Which goes to my third point. Ooh, yes. Right? Getting out of your head. Oh, I didn't even talk about number two, which is practicing, right? Rehearsing, okay. saying it out loud. Oh, let's That's talk about that. With nerves. Okay. Practicing. Practicing is not just thinking it through in your head if you're going to say it out loud to other humans. Practicing is saying it out loud to other humans. If you don't have another human, you could say it to an animal or a video recording device. And it, worst case, say it out to people who are on the subway with you or walking by you in the park. I am very famous for this. So that's what that guy was doing the other day. He was just practicing. Yes, mostly if you see people talking on the street, they're practicing and going through the ovation rehearsal process, I'm sure. Very well. Most importantly, if you can, out loud three times with a specific goal at the end of each of those times. If you have a presentation or you're kicking off a meeting or you're even going into a difficult conversation and you're like, I'm just going to practice it. I'm going to repeat it. Blah, 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 blah. You've now just made any bad habits worse. You've gotten non-productive habits into your muscle memory. So practicing out loud with a goal in mind each time, and it could be, I'm going to practice it this time and looking at the structure of this story or making sure my content is well aligned. And the next one is up on your feet, even if you're never going to say it while standing and you can stand, then I'm going to think about my body language. And then the third time through is all the way through without stopping as if it were the real deal, if possible. We call that the dress rehearsal. I understand that in real life, busy professionals, myself included, don't always have time to practice everything out loud. In the presentation world, I'd say if you don't have time, just get us to like the, the intro, the conclusion, and then maybe some any wonky, difficult transitions in between. Practicing out loud with a specific goal in mind each time will help practice. Uh, essentially, just remember, count, uh, practice with accountability. Yeah. yeah I've, I've done, I remember recently I was trying to do, was for the, one of the EO events, there's that TED Talk type thing, and we were practicing. Um, and I remember a stark difference between practicing by myself in a conference room. And I can do a good job of pretending there's people in there, um, but you drop an actual human in there. It's, it's different. Just, it's different. Yeah. Even if they're like, they're, they're on your team, they're nice. You're like, they're your biggest fan. They're your assistant or something. And they're going to be the nicest, kindest person. Even if they're just going to lie out their teeth, they're going to, you're not going to feel humiliated, but it's just something else having another human life in that room, you know, being, you know, and their time now has been given to you. So you better use that time. So I think it's what a great reminder to actually practice with a person. But you know, sometimes you're in you know, like an office and you don't want to say it out loud. But you, I, that other point you had, you have to say it out loud. Even if you got to go to the car, be by yourself right. or the stairwell, you got to go somewhere where you can say it out loud and just practice getting it out there. Yes. Um, then one question I had for you, uh, at one point you were like, blah, 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 blah. Were, were you alluding to the idea that like you have to practice the way you you want to do it. Like you can't just like speed runner, speed racer, go through it and be like, Oh, I ran through it because it's like, yeah, but now you're pra like, you're saying like, now you're practicing the wrong speed. Do you have to make each one of them realistic? 
Yes, and to that question. So yes, it's going to be very helpful if you do it in a realistic way. Speed racer rehearsing is a a rehearsal technique. It is something you could do. It is helpful. You don't want every single iteration to be speed racer because then speed racer is going to be in your muscle memory. I also want to know how many more references to television shows from the 60s and 70s I can make in this one podcast recording. I don't know. Were you around? I, I wasn't around for it. Some of it, not. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Well, I'm not. I think. I, well, I might age myself later. We'll see. I don't know. I mean, you look like a millennial, so whatever. That's right. <laughs> I am. <laughs> okay, so that was number two. Was the practicing out loud? Yes. What is trace? What is number three? Trace is. Back to you mentioned it. You said, what about breathing well before? So yeah, breathing well before all under this umbrella of number trace, pre-game ritual. And that can be anything for anyone. This is about you. What my pre-game is, is probably not going to be your pre-game. And I would say whatever works for you. Breathing and that really good Deep breath, core breathing, lots of exercises. If you want some ideas, contact me. All good. A warm up, you can fully do a physical warm up, a speaker's warm up, a vocal warm up. Uh, that's a good time to do speed racer run through too in the warm up. Anything th- that visualization, listening to music, anything that works for you, mantra. I have a friend of mine shared with me that his pregame ritual is spraying a certain cologne Hmm. and that's part of his pregame gets him in the mindset to go and get confident and go out and work what's yours i have a right it really depends on the mood a lot is i a physical warm-up for sure ideally i will walk kind of do my speed racer run through right not right before but if if i'm doing like a big keynote or something i'll do a big uh, walk around as much as possible. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Nebraska speaking at EO Nebraska. I did a keynote for them. Oh, cool. And I, so I went in, I did my tech check. I had a while before the event was starting. So I, and I was on a college campus. So I did a big walk around talking to myself. All the undergrads were like, hey, who's the new girl? And why is she talking to herself? Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> did you give out any numbers along the way? You're like, I can't. Yes, I bet I maybe. Um, Don't tell my husband. Okay. Right. Right. So okay. So a little bit of walk. You get the physical movement, and maybe you're talking to yourself, like you know, jazzing yourself up, that kind of thing. That's cool. Yes. Yes. I uh, jumping jacks. We we even have something we have taught in the past. We we have it available if you're interested. We call it a stall warm up. So it's small enough warm up that you could do it in the bathroom stall. Oh, that's cool. That is cool. You know, w- one of mine used to be listening to music and jumping on a trampoline. Oh, did you travel with the trampoline? No. That seems. I would be baller if I did. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, that's committed. You're like, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got to bounce. I need. Yeah, green- whenever it works. <laughs> green M&Ms in the bowl and I need a trampoline yes. of this size and diameter in my, yes. in my state room. Um, Yeah, but some kind of physical move. I like the fact that you're combining the physical movement uh, music for for the right people. For some people, uh, it can just really put you in a different place, you know, and get you in that that mode. Can you ever come out with too much energy or no? Like get too pumped up and you're just a weirdo? Or is that just in my head? That's a really good question. I, maybe you, I, I, you can come out with the wrong tone to match the message Ooh. and you could come out uh, uh, that so frenetic that your message isn't coming out clearly i i have i am very high energy and i've never been accused of having too much energy yeah it's typically a compliment after and but i do i've observed what you're talking about and it's it's being too rushed it's it's all it's a mess and all over the place and thoughts are not well planned and that can really trip you up yeah interesting uh matching the tone yeah it, it's eulogy hey everybody let's go what's up right. 
John is dead. Right. Walking out, right? You go into your town hall for your company. You're like, hi, everybody. We're tanking. Yeah. 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 You got this, Susan. All right. Right. Yeah. No, you get a match. <laughs> right. I right. 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 Um, you know, there's something interesting that happened to me too. A, wa- a while back, I was speaking and I wanted to hype myself up. And I remember drinking a Red Bull right before going on stage. How should I go? Uh, you know, I was kind of that that little too much energy. Well, not too much energy, but like I, I was talking too fast. And I remember I was actually paired up with someone and they were talking slowly and deliberately. And I was like, full of energy. I'm excited. I'm passionate about this topic. And it was okay. I was passionate. But I realized in that moment as it's happening that it, it almost felt like the smarter person What's talking slower? Could you talk to like how fast or slow you should talk? Pace is something we talk about all the time. And I think, you know, so Ovation is 10 years old. I had a, a, another consultancy for five years before that. So I've, and I was coaching before that. So I've been doing this a long time. And I have in all those years, like 17 years, only ever observed one time somebody talking too slowly, just once. And loads and loads of time of people talking very, very fast. If, and then the coach comes in and and I feel an unseasoned coach may say something like, well, you're speaking too fast, so let's slow down, right? They see you uh, all tweaked out on Red Bull and they're like, Casey, slow down. That's, that is not helpful. Again, that's like me being like, don't look at the elephant. Don't see right. the elephant. If you're, if you have good articulation, right? If you're speaking clearly, so if we can, and it's not mushy mouthed and we can understand the words, which isn't always the case. That's a little bit of a different problem. Rather than working with somebody and saying, well, just slow down. The coaches, myself included, will say, let's implement pause. Let's work on getting some thoughtful pauses in there or breaths or whatever that is. Because even if we're speaking really fast, as long as our audience can understand and we give them time to consume the information, maybe it's not so bad. That was really fast. That's very impressive, actually. Thank you. Yeah, just a little bit of a pause and and being okay with the white space, the the quiet, you know, just for a second to kind of play with that. It feels weird. That's a huge, one of the major reasons why in public speaking, often people will do a lot of filler words or, well, so we've got them verbal viruses, but we've kind of, that is the word virus has kind of gotten a bad rap in the past couple of years. So verbal Corona, you heard it here. <laughs> Carrie Garden. Market. Trademark. So we, so we're really more airing on the side of filler words right now. So the filler words are because people don't like silence can go back to fear. It can go, it feels long. That's, that's one of the major reasons why we do it. And the thing is pauses, although they may feel epic to us are really welcomed by your audience, whether that's a big audience, an audience of one. And while it may feel like if I take a really good, thoughtful pause that I've ordered out for a pizza, it arrived, I took a bite of the first slice, whatever, it, it's not that long to the audience. Yesterday, day before, I was on a, guess what, Casey and EO event, and <laughs> there was a, a woman speaker, and she was telling a story, and we're in the virtual environment, so we're, it's already you know, lousy with distractions anyway. And I'm really interested in what she's saying. And I'm really focused, trying to be focused on her, but stuff, I got people in the house and things are happening. And I, and I got a little sidetracked and I was looking down at my desk and in the middle of a story, she paused. It was an extraordinarily long pause. And by that, I mean, maybe like two seconds, but it was enough that I was like, what is this? (laughs) And it is, it's so powerful and it really, really draws you in as an audience it, member. Was it like you were called on in class and everyone knew it? You didn't? <laughs> They're all looking at you. What was the answer, Casey? Oh God, what was the question? <laughs> 
Yes, my my in was it was more like Carrie. Please stop talking. Oh, yeah, yeah. What can I say? But no, it's always longer in our heads than it is for the Absolutely. audience. And maybe they're taking notes of all the amazing things you've been saying, and they could use an extra five seconds to catch up. Right. It, 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 their brain can always use five seconds and understand when we're speaking to somebody. That may not be the predominant way they learn or take in information. So maybe if I'm speaking to an audience, half the people could be visual learners. And here I am like, blah, blah, blah. And the audience, <laughs> audible people are loving it. But the visual people are like, don't you have another slide? Is there possibly something else I could look at? Like, who knows? That's a great point. Uh, I tend to forget that people learn in ways other than myself. So it's a good reminder. <laughs> That is a good reminder. To consider everyone. <laughs> quick quick thing on filler words, and I, I love the switch uh, pace in a second. Um, filler words, best way to get rid of them. Pause. Really? Replace I, with a pause. Replace practice pause. your pause. Practice your pause. So I, when I first started doing this, was big into the ums human nature habit don't like silence the whole shebang and i had to practice to beat them out of me especially if i'm talking to business professionals about not using filler words because of what they can do to our credibility and how distracting they are and i am confident that most people listening watching have at some point sat in an audience and ticked off or checked off made marks of how many times somebody said a certain filler word <laughs> it, it gets that distracting so i had to practice replacing the ums and the filler words with a pause and take it my advice is take it in small chunks don't say i'm gonna go on a podcast at one o'clock today and not say any filler words it it's difficult taking it in small chunks however i'm gonna get on this next phone call and not use any filler words. I'm going to tell a story to my friend, not use any filler words. You can let them know, say, I'm working on this thing. I'm doing some professional development. And yes, you, you will slow down at first, it, especially it will depends how much they're in your muscle memory. It will absolutely slow you down and then it gets better. It gets faster. And the pause gets more in your muscle memory than the filler word. Mm. So Magic. I would tell my husband, Eric, stories like this. <clears throat> Today, I went to Target and I bought paper towels. Now, he nearly divorced me, at, uh, but things are better now. And I, I've beaten them out of me, myself. Wow. You heard it here. And so... What what was the word that would be there instead? For me? Yeah, I was like, today uh, I was going to be... Yeah, today um, I went to uh, Target. Especially when people really project on that, um, like, today, um, you're like, oh, oh God. Yeah, for me, it, it, I've been noticing I've said the word like, and sometimes I start sounding like a valley girl, and I... Is that a filler word or yeah. am I use it? Is that like just a weak technique or something? That is a filler word. Mine is so full disclosure, everybody. You've probably heard me say it. I know my current one is so, so it could be, and it could be like, it could be any phrase. One of the ones that I, uh, one session that I sat through years ago and, and tick marked down how many times this guy said it was are you with me are you with me are you with me and it was painful i don't remember what he was talking about but i remember that he said are you with me 137 times in 15 minutes the presenter did mm -hmm. and it wasn't tony robbins it, it was not if you with me say i hi <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that would get really annoying yes Great. See, we're just practicing here, folks. So my next question, I love to shift gears a little bit. Who are you? Carrie, who are you? Take me back to little you days. Did you always know you're going to be teaching, 
folks how to present and project and speak clearly, be an actress, all these things from little age. What did, what were you thinking? When I was five, my pa- I grew up in Baltimore, okay. and my parents took me to see the Nash the first national tour of Annie, the musical Annie. And I already was dancing, and I already was playing the piano, and I already knew that I liked to sing. And we went out to dinner after, I'm sure it was matinee. We, and so we go out to dinner right after the show, and lo and behold, all the little girls who were playing the orphans, except for the girl who played Annie, came and sat at the table next to us. They were having the next show. Yeah, and my, like, my mind, I'm five years old, and my mind is like blown. I'm like, oh my God, this is like the best celebrity sighting I've ever had in my entire life. And I happened to get in the conversation with the girl who played Molly, the youngest girl, who was also five at the time. And she's telling me how great it is to be an actress and to be on tour and that you get tutored. You don't go to school and you can shop and you go out to dinners and you do the show and you get to sing and dance. And I was like, this is amazing. Oh man. And And it was at that dinner, I told my parents, I was like, I'm going to be an actress. And my parents, while my parents were crying, the (laughs) little girl told me, she was like, well, it was nice. You know, we all were getting up to leave. She's like, nice to meet you. And I was like, great. So nice to meet you. I'm Carrie. And she said, I'm, I'm Melissa. And I was like, oh, thank you so much. So nice to meet you. So that was Alyssa Milano. And really? Yeah. We did not stay in touch, Uh but back to another sitcom. Who's the boss? Who's the boss? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she was on Who's the Boss. This is where our age difference is really showing, Casey and I'm like, No, no, I, I've seen this show. I have seen this show. But does that make me seem younger? I'm okay with that. Okay. I'll play the- I'll Yes, play but the, that makes me seem older and I'm not okay. With I'll that. sell you a newspaper. Absolutely. <laughs> you like the reference? Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So, you just, from an early age, you're like, this sounds- Great. I can skip school. I get tutored. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And so I went from there, from there. And it's funny because now thinking back now that, yes, I'm an actress. I still work. I'm also very much an entrepreneur. And I realized what I was doing all the way back then, then at like eight and nine years old, looking in the, speaking of newspapers, literally looking in the newspaper for the audition notices was very much an entrepreneurial spirit yeah. to, to get my foot in the door in terms of show business. So little Carrie loved to sing and dance and act. And I went to arts camps. I started working professionally at 12. I got my first professional job at 12. I went to the Baltimore School for the Arts. With some very famous classmates, as we had discussed. And okay, so you went to school with Jada Pinkett Smith and Tupac? Yes. 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 Oh, and I have the yearbook right here. Look. (laughs) Yeah. And it actually says Tupac. That's his actual name. Yes. It says, uh, can you see this? Because again, no, that's it. Yeah. Can you see Tupac Shakur? Totally his name. And then right above it, oddly, right in the picture, not oddly, because they're both in theater, but there's Jada right there. Interesting. So that's why they were friends. I remember hearing that like Will Smith had to be cool with them being friends and. Yeah, but also understand my high school class was 55 people. Like it was a very small arts high school. Here's me rocking some bangs right here. And at the time, so I was a double major. So I started as a voice major. Oh, look at you. Sorry. Okay. I started as a voice major and then I went into theater. And then, because they didn't have musical theater per se there. So. Right. You and Tupac weren't doing like Peter Pan together. No, I, no. We, just for fun, like in the library. But other than that, no, he was, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so crazy. So and you just kept at it, kept at it. Where, where does the. Where does the company come from? Where does your company? So I, I go to college. I get to be a musical theater. I moved to New York and I'm like, I'm doing it. Well, I'm, I had already been doing it. So I was continuing yeah. to work and work and work and work. And I got to a point in New York that I 
was working and, and doing pretty well. I was not super famous. I was doing a lot of theater, a lot of musical theater, a little bit of television film, nothing gigantic. And in between my gigs, I started to get a little bored. I got, I, my survival stuff was working at restaurants. I was doing banquet sales at a high-end steakhouse and doing some hostessing. I was a little underused in terms of brain. Yeah. And my boyfriend at the time, now husband, said, why don't you get a job in, in sales? Because th that can be flexible. You could still do some acting. And it was a good time in my life to get a little more stable and a little better health insurance than my union offered. <laughs> so I got a sales job at uh, one of the big payroll companies. And I, although I was older than most of the, the other salespeople who had started, because it's a very good, like, out of college job for business students or maybe, yeah, probably mostly business or I don't know, other thing. I don't know. I don't know what real people do. So I realized, even though I had zero, zero experience and I, I go up to training and I get trained and I have actually an equivalent to an accounting minor, which is hilarious. Wow. And I started outselling people in my office that had been there for years, years and years and years. And I couldn't understand why the, I was like, why? I hate, I'm like, I hated selling payroll. I was going to class and still auditioning. And I'm like, this sucks. What, what is happening? And I got approached by one of the payroll reps in the office. And she said, you know, I've been here 12 years. You've been here six months. You're out selling me. What are you doing? And I was like, I have no, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> But because she took me, I, I took her out with me one day. We went out with her one day. And I realized that because of my self-awareness and storytelling ability and, and, and professional presence and all this stuff, I knew to work as an actor, an actor that uh, business professionals could probably use some help in this department. And that was kind of the first idea. And lo and behold, many, many years later through some windy mud ridden roads <laughs> uh we got to ovation wow yeah wow here we are here we are and now you're teaching everyone i mean how how important is that i it really does help your career it show, this person has been grinding away and and you just come in with just a little bit of presentation skills and you're outselling them i mean how important is it for managers at all levels to just have a little bit of this training. I, 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 vital that yeah. we work with a lot of people will come to us and say, I'm on the precipice of this promotion. Help me get there. Or I'm about to get a promote, or I just got a promotion. I'm now VP of blah, 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 blah. And I need to act like a VP. I need to behave like a VP. And that is, that's professional presence. Yeah. It's um, an imposter other, syndrome, right? Like, oh bit. God, they, they did hire me to be the VP of operations. Yes. <laughs> now right. I got to actually do the job. Do it. It, everyone, right. Everyone's looking to me to answer the question and I have to give up and give a meeting and talk about our future and like, oh geez. Yes. <laughs> now yeah, the butterflies or, are coming. Or these really, really smart people will come and say, I'm speaking at a conference and I I know my stuff. I know what I coded or I know what I built. I don't know how to talk to talk mm. to people about that. So that's a huge line of business for us as well, getting getting speakers ready for conferences. Smart. I can see us doing a whole series together on how to prepare and get ready to do a podcast interview, you know? Yes. At, in or fact, do your own I, podcast. I know. Oh, you could. Do you know that I'm coaching one of your podcast interviewees later today? Oh, exciting. They, Talk about they reached out. Yeah. Yes. Exciting. Uh, so one question, I can't let you go without asking this question. It is hypothetical. Yes. I may or may not have a time machine in Nashua, New Hampshire. And let's say I do, and it's in the backyard under a tarp. You come up, we have some beers and we get to use the time machine, but it's a special kind and it goes back, back in time. And, it, and you get to visit yourself. You get to meet yourself. It's not back to the future. You can talk to yourself. Give yourself a high five, a hug, whatever. What kind of advice would you give to you? And what time and frame? It's right after school. So it's right after the undergrad. You graduated. A couple of days later, 
you get to meet that version of yourself. What would you tell her? Okay. At that point, I was packing up my apartment in Syracuse, New York, and I was shoving it in my mother's station wagon to drive to Hershey Park, where I had my summer job performing there. I would get in the front seat and turn around and tell her, first of all, Carrie, please just stop trying to get back together with Benjamin because he's gay and it's never going to happen. (laughs) <laughs> okay. I would, that would just be like, that was a colossal waste of time. That's how much time would that have saved you? Right. <laughs> um, so much time. Oh, and then I would have added on like, and also don't waste your time with three other people. And then, three other. Yeah. Yes. These names yes. are off, off limits. Okay. Just, just, just don't try. I, yes. just, you know, buddies more like a lunch friendship. Okay. Yeah. And then I would say, say yes to Every international travel opportunity that is offered to you, whether that is a job or going to a friend's wedding, because a couple of those, I said, no, I I can't do it. I can't leave New York for that long or no, I can't afford it. And I definitely wish I, in retrospect, wish I had. And I think thirdly, I would say your career actor or wherever this takes you is your own and and you're going to be lucky enough to stay healthy for a long time hopefully longer than right now in this moment it's and it's not a race so think of it as your own path and your own party rather than comparing yourself to what other people are doing and and their timeline because it's all different yeah so 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 important not to compare yourself. It's your journey. It's only your journey. Amazing. That's right. Where can people connect with you? Where do you want them to hit you up? Social platforms, websites, all that jazz. Oh, you can connect with me on the LinkedIn hmm. or the Facebook. Okay. Right? Lots of stuff going on over there. I do some Don't lives. you mean that, that newly pronounced thing? What are they calling it now? Oh, meta. Meta. Oh, oh, now it's listening to us. Quick run. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then my we- the website of Ovation is getovation.com. Check out what we do. You'll see some cool things there, such as Studio G, which is our new B2C self-serve platform. If you're just, right, if your corporation's not going to come on board, if your content speaker manager is not going to hire us, you can just come in. Swoop on in, check out getstudioG.com and get some coaching. Come on in yeah. for a month. Come on in for a couple months. We'll get, really we'll anyone, get you there any, any level too. It just, everyone yeah. will benefit. Just what does it, what does it take to get me to that next level? Yes. Act yes. the part before exactly. you get it. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. I love it. Thank you so much for coming out here. It was so much fun to learn from you and ask you some actual questions I have and, and yeah, this was a blast. You're very welcome. I had an okay time. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, this will we'll never see the light of day. <laughs> and edit it. Off to the archives. <laughs> <laughs> this was now my least favorite episode. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> this was the boringest thing I've done. In a it's podcast. okay. We'll just we'll just release it the next yeah you know, next week. Every time you ask me, when is it, when is it coming out? Right, when are you coming out? Right. Next week. Comes out yeah. next week. It's like free beer tomorrow. It was a sign in a restaurant, you know? Right. Uh, oh, yes. Right. This, well, thank you. I actually did have a delightful time. Smashing good time. Cheerio. Smashing good time. We, we talked about high school and television shows and, well, what did we talk about? Seriously. Ex-boyfriends. I mean, we really, we got deep fast. Yeah. And that's, and that's just with an hour. I know. know. Imagine. Just, uh, imagine. <laughs> well, thanks again. This has been awesome. You're welcome. Thank you for having me, of course. Yes. And for those people listening, if you learned something, and I freaking know you did, because I have two pages of notes front and back over here, then share this with someone. Get it out of your hands. Get it into someone else's hands. and definitely get some speaker training, get some presentation training so that you can just get yourself to the next level, whatever that level is. And with that, this has been another really cool episode of Leadership in Action. I will see you all next time. 
Leadership in Action is sponsored by the Boston chapter of the Entrepreneurs Organization. As the world's only peer-to-peer -peer network exclusively for entrepreneurs, EO helps transform the lives of those who transform the world.